Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Mark Salter. I'm the executive director for CFA Society Minnesota, and I always get the fun and the lucky task of welcoming everybody and thanking our speakers, Nancy and Jake, um, and their colleagues, uh, Jay and Ali and other folks. Um, a shout out to Andrew Rem, our program's chair, who um, made this particular event happen today. Thank you, Mr. Rem. And I also have the happy task of thanking our sponsors, um, the, the firms that generous, generously contribute their time, talent, and treasure every year to make sure we can do high quality professional learning events like this. So we can't do it without them. And uh, we thank them every, every chance we get. So thank you sponsors. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let Nancy and Jake begin to share theirs. Um, and one housekeeping thing as we get started, they're gonna uh, leave us a good 20 minutes or so for Q&A. And if you want to type your questions in chat, you're welcome to do it. But uh, we decided to, um, to fly without a net today and we'll be letting people turn on their microphones uh, when Q&A time comes. So uh, keep your questions brief, concise, and to the point. If you start uh, delivering some sort of thesis, we will cut you off. Um, and with that, again, Nancy, Jake, take it away, and thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. Well, thank you, Mark, Andrew, uh, very much for uh, inviting us to speak. Um, there is a lot going on. We do do the global economy. Um, I'm going to focus on the United States, touch on the global, and if there are any other questions on the foreign backdrop, we can certainly come back to that as we uh, uh, dur during the Q&A period. But our general theme for 2022, and I think you'll see this um, as we go through, is that uh, the world's getting very, very complicated. Uh, as we came out of the COVID uh, recession, obviously we had a very strong V rebound in economic activity, uh, i.e. things were pretty synchronized going, going up. But as we move into 2022, or maybe even here as we end 2022, we're seeing a lot of decoupling uh, within consumer spending, within individual countries, et cetera. So our theme is you have to do a lot more homework uh, for 2022 to understand exactly the economic, uh, the economic backdrop. Um, there are to be sure risks. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these right now. We're, we're pretty optimistic on the U.S. economic outlook. We understand there are risks. We can certainly come back and discuss these. Uh, we're watching the COVID situation and, and certainly the, the Omicron situation very closely right now to see if we have to make any short term tweaks uh, to our economic uh, to our economic uh, outlook. So, again, we're cognizant uh, to be sure of these of these risks. But from a general economic perspective, for the U.S. in particular, we're optimistic on the growth trajectory. Uh, we expect roughly 4% U.S. real GDP for 2022. Uh, that will be after something around 5%, maybe more than 5% for here in 2021. Um, we, we expect uh, uh, for fourth quarter GDP, we expect 6% GDP growth here for here in the fourth quarter, particularly robust uh, quarter. From a, a component perspective, we are optimistic on consumer spending. We think it though slows uh, in 2022 to about three to 4%, but within it, you're gonna have huge bifurcation. Some areas consumption is gonna go down and some areas consumption is gonna go up. You'll, you'll see that. We like capital uh, We like capital, capital spending in the United States. We're very bullish on capital spending, more so than consumer, we're at 8% capital spending growth. And when it comes to housing, after the V rebound in 2020, uh, a more moderate growth trajectory, but still positive on housing, about 5%. Perhaps our most controversial uh, outlook is that we are expecting a sharp slowdown um, in U.S. headline and core uh, inflation. We think near-term wage inflation is going to continue to accelerate here in the fourth quarter, but even wage inflation will start to moderate as you get incrementally more labor, uh, labor supply. We're very bullish on the employment outlook. We're very bullish on the labor supply outlook. Combination of that helps uh, that more supply will help ease uh, in will help ease wage inflation. And at the same time, given our view on product on capital spending, we're very optimistic on the capital spending cycle. It's already been very strong. We think that continues. Uh, we're very bullish on productivity growth. And that combination of moderate wage inflation with an excel with, with solid productivity growth um, helps to keep unit labor costs tame and again further increases the odds we see 
uh, tame, uh, tame inflation. Globally, we think the United States is the leader uh, of the global economy. It's been the case for the past uh, uh, six, seven years. The U.S. has been driving global growth. We, we indeed think that continues, and that is being supported by our capital spending outlook. China is going through a secular shift down in growth of which they've engineered, which they want. I'm not bearish on China, but they're done driving global growth, something closer to 5% maybe even somewhat slower. The Eurozone will be the weakest uh, foreign economy, DM economy. Um, they are very sensitive to uh, higher energy prices and the lagged effect of the surge in energy prices, along with higher interest rates within the EM and DM world will slow Eurozone uh, growth. And within some EMs, you might actually experience recessions given their, given their tightening cycle. But let me come back to the United States and, and again, stay mainly focused on that. This is just a quick snapshot of our uh, economic uh, of our economic outlook. And over here, you can see where the 4% GDP for 2022, uh, 3%, maybe that there's some upside to that four, uh, but uh, capital spending indeed being the biggest driver. And by the end of the year, uh, we have a clear slowdown in both the headline uh, and core uh, in, in, in inflation. One rule of thumb I've, I've uh, has been reinforced into in, 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 in our thinking over the past year is careful extrapolating from the latest data point in the, uh, thinking that as trend. Um, you have to, again, uh, be constantly looking ahead, focusing on leading indicators of where we're going, not where we are or where we've uh, or where we've been. And so that's what uh, we try to do. We have a model here for US GDP growth. It's, it's not a number that we just pick out of thin air. Uh, the relative health of the economy right now is being driven by the health of corporate America. And you see that most clearly reflected in, in uh, very low corporate spreads. Uh, you see it also reflected in the health of the banking system, um, both of which are better than they were coming out of the 2008-2009 uh, recession. Interest rates are an incremental headwind even here for the United States. This is the two-year rate of change and 10-year uh, yields tend to lead U.S. GDP growth uh, by about uh, two years. So higher interest rates are just starting to become uh, also an incremental headwind on growth. But those things are uh, offset more than offset by health in the banking system and health in uh, corporate uh, corporate America. We also uh, expect a, a decline in the ISM. I know the ISM today remained strong for the month of November. These charts are only through October. Um, but again, uh, those forces will slow uh, uh, manufacturing activity some as we move through 20, uh, 2022. Uh, but we still have the ISM re relatively elevated, something around 54, uh, but we would expect that to actually um, uh, slow. Within it, you're having a little bit of, of a tug of war where you know orders have shifted down some. I know it was up a little bit today for November, but orders have shifted down. And importantly, production is shifting up within the ISM. And so that's keeping it, it's keeping it elevated. We need stronger production, which we're now starting to get. Um, to ha help further rebuild inventories, which we think uh, is indeed uh, is indeed happening right now. And I'm actually going to take a, a, a maybe a little bit of a surprising uh, step toward focusing on inventories um, because it's going to dovetail nicely into our inflation uh, into our in in inflation uh, story. Um, and we think inventories are not fully understood. So again, what the ISM data are showing us is we are getting a shift up in inventory growth, but what is the level of inventories? There's not been enough attention uh, on, on, on that. Um, and, and let me pass it over uh, to Jake. Yeah, so we've all heard about this fear of running out of stuff, empty shelves, you know, retailers not having enough for, for the holiday shopping season, et cetera. But one of the things that's missed in this whole conversation is sort of the dynamics between sales and inventory levels uh, in the economy right now. And what you see when you strip it down, when you sort of break this, this inventory sales ratio apart, which to be sure is very low, uh, you see that inventories uh, in, in, in sort of raw terms are actually well above now pre-COVID trends, right? It took a while uh, to recover in the early stages of the pandemic. We had this big disconnect uh, between households that were awash with liquidity, awash with cash, uh, and the production side of the economy that took a while to ramp back up. So in 2020, you had household disposable income in real terms, which was up six and a quarter percent. You had industrial production in the U.S. that was down seven percent. Again, a huge disconnect between supply and demand. It was a supply and a demand shock, both in sort of in the same direction when it comes to uh, to goods prices and goods inventories. So we had to work that back. But more recently, uh, towards the, the back half of, of, of 2021, we've recovered uh, in inventory levels. What's been the issue and what's keeping this lean 
strong demand still related in the good sector, still related to, to multiple COVID waves. We just came off of, of the Delta wave. Who knows what's going to happen with, with Omicron? We'll know, we'll know more about that over the next couple of weeks. But that's kept goods demand um, extremely above the pre-COVID trend. As demand normalizes, as you get this goods to services handoff, which we'll, we'll touch on in a little bit, the inventory to sales ratios will normalize pretty quickly given where inventory levels currently sit today. So you don't even need to see any more inventory building to get this correction in IS ratios. And this, again, this, this, is, this is a misunderstood fact here that inventory levels are actually quite healthy. And it's going to be something that as we transition from goods to services on the demand side, as you get this, this demand shock to goods in 22 is gonna have a material effect on pricing uh, ability for, for a lot of retailers. So as IS ratios move back up, pricing power uh, tends to decline. So actually, Jake, today I'm, I was reading the New York Times, catching up on some of my reading today. I don't know if anybody can see this other than me, but I'll read it to you. It's the front page of the business section. And I just had an interesting conversation with, a, with an investor and he says, oh, some of the big box retailers, they've got plenty of inventories, but boy, they're smaller companies. They're really struggling. So the article in the New York Times today is stocking up early to stay afloat later. It talks about a small retailer, uh, 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 small retailers hoarding inventories, hoarding inventories. So IS ratios can be very dangerous. You have to pull them apart like Jake just did. And again, you are hearing from large retailers. They have plenty of inventories. And, and I got a chuckle out of the article today. Particularly after I just got blasted saying, oh, well, Walmart's an, an anomaly. And it's, it's not, I'm sorry. Our, our, our economic data are company data. Um, Walmart's in here, Home Depot's in here, Target's in here, uh, and as are smaller, as our, as our smaller retailers. And for those of us that have been in the business, business a long time, this to me is very reminiscent of Y2K, we're calling it Y2K 2.0 where uh, again, you, you, had a, you had demand pulled forward uh, because of the concern as you move to 20 uh, to 2000, your, your computers wouldn't work, airplanes wouldn't work, your ATM machines weren't, weren't, wouldn't work. Those were all real, real fears. And so you had this rush to buy computers up 20% over two years. Inventories were kind of growing, but not quite as fast. Therefore, IS ratios were going down and the community thought there were no computers. Um, there were, uh, just that sales were growing faster. So very, very similar analogy. And it ended in tears for those companies that were touched by uh, this, this demand pull forward in that IS ratios did eventually spike. Inventories did end up increasing more than sales and prices did start to decelerate again on the downside. So this is not historically unprecedented. Uh, right now, it's still a very difficult topic. I think people are not, it's not consensus. Um, and so we do get a lot of pushback uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. In conjunction with inventories, there's been another disruption uh, to supply, and that's been what's gone on in the, chip, uh, the shipping uh, uh, industry. And we think that is also an important positive turning point, helping to ease uh, concerns about inventories and also uh, pricing. So again, let me pass it over to Jake. Yeah, so I mean, to be clear, there, there's still a significant amount of congestion uh, at the LA uh, Long Beach ports in particular, uh, as of sort of the end of last week, there were still something like 90 container ships out there. Uh, they changed, you know, one of the things to be aware of is they changed this to this new queuing system. So now they're, the, the, the ships that they capture inside of this 40 mile radius zone are the anchored ships that you're seeing and you're seeing declines in that metric. And yeah, that's, that's this, this metric has, has declined precipitously recently because of this new system. It's, it's, um, it's a bit disingenuous because you still have a big backlog out there. But what we're seeing in terms of the leading indicators of this, we're seeing freight rates that have come down. You see the, the, the freight rate composite in general. Uh, you see the China to the West Coast uh, freight rates. Those have come down. Those tend to lead uh, congestion uh, overall. And then the other thing that we have to keep in mind is the holiday shopping season is done, like the holiday shipping season is done, I should say. And so as we move into the first quarter, which tends to be a seasonally weak uh, period for, for incoming uh, of, of container ships, uh, specifically from Asia, um, as you have the Chinese New Year and you have the sort of the post-holiday um, hangover in terms of, uh, you know, you don't, need, you don't need to stockpile inventories anymore. If we can maintain current run rates of activity in the LALB ports in terms of what they're processing, so they've done, um, they've handled about 20% more loaded containers in 2021 than the 2017 to 2019 average, right? So they're doing 20% more in terms of volume, uh, despite all of the concerns about um, supply chains, et cetera. They're actually cranking it out pretty, pretty heavily. If they maintain this pace as we head into this uh, seasonally slow period, 
you're going to get to a point where similarly to last year, uh, during March, April, May, uh, March in particular, that's, that's sort of the slowest month, you're going to have capacity that's 50% above what the typical incoming is uh, for, for that month. And so you can work down this backlog of, of loaded container ships pretty quickly, we think, uh, through, through, the, through the first quarter of, of next year. And what this means is a lot of inventory coming in, right? These 90 ships, 80 plus ships, um, we estimate they have about $30 billion worth of consumer goods. That's about 50% of all the consumer goods imports that we do uh, in any given month recently. And so it's just a ton of inventory that's gonna add uh, to this narrative on, on uh, inventory levels that are healthy as sales taper off uh, you know, post holidays. So we see, we see this as a trend that's going to get exacerbated uh, in the first quarter of, of next year. So inventories contributing to growth, plenty of inventories helping to lower, uh, lower, lower uh, inflation. And we're going to come back and, and spend a little bit more time on, on inflation. But let's now jump to another somewhat controversial topic, although maybe not as controversial as, as we had earlier in the summer. We've been very optimistic on the U.S. job outlook. We remain very optimistic on the U.S. job outlook. Uh, our, our theme has been the demand is there as the economy reopens. Uh, the payrolls will indeed uh, meet uh, the, all those help wanted ads, i.e. Job, uh, job, job openings. The recovery in job openings this, 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 uh, over the past 18 months has just been stunning. You, you hit a new high in less than a year. Uh, in job openings. In contrast, if you go back and look at the last expansion, job openings did hit a new high for four or five years uh, after the end of the recession. So this is a very healthy uh, uh, job labor labor market. I, I would just ask, uh, let's let's look at the facts and, and not necessarily at, at a lot of the hype or negative hype uh, as the case uh, may, uh, may, 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 may be. Um, we would also argue that there is not a skills mismatch uh, highly technical jobs is where you've seen the strongest job growth with, with employment in, in areas like tech, healthcare, and manufacturing and construction back to pre-COVID levels. The problem with employment spend, uh, those sectors of the economy that have been hit, held back, closed down by COVID. Um, and so, uh, and as, again, the uh, Omicron uh, uh, variant may, may hold job growth back in this sector, but uh, it is it is unique. It is not a reflection of a sluggish job market. Uh, in fact, it's a very robust job market. The unemployment rate again has come down dramatically. We think we're, we approach four percent by the end of the year, um, and we're going to be back. We're going to be closer to three percent by the end of 2022. Today, what's perhaps most controversial about uh, the employment backdrop is labor supply, and we're also optimistic on on labor supply. Again, don't get caught up in looking at the latest data point and extrapolating forward. The key is to focus on leading uh, on leading indicators. And what is the single best leading indicator for labor supply? It's probably a metric you've not really heard about, but it's part of the monthly payroll employment report. It's called the Employment Diffusion Index. It measures the percentage of industries that are hiring. Um, and it has had a very strong recovery starting uh, early last cycle. Um, this recession, it didn't even go down, uh, went down, I think, for one month. Um, and then over the past year, it's averaged 65, which is basically off the chart. Over the past 10 years, it's 60. Why is she doing 10 years, you're asked? Well, what's the beauty of this particular metric is actually it's a very good secular uh, leading indicator of the underlying demand for jobs. Um, and it's directly linked to blue collar jobs. I guess maybe most of you don't know. I'm I'm from um, Flint, Michigan, which which uh, obviously was a big industrial town. Um, uh, Jake here is from Newark, which when he was growing up was a big industrial town. Um, and both cities have actually obviously been decimated um, as you had shifts down, uh, lagged effects of the shift down in goods producing jobs. Goods producing jobs have high employment multipliers, i.e. for every goods producing jobs, there's three to five other jobs being created in other industries. And when we allowed capital spending to move from the United States to China, you destroyed goods producing jobs. They went down by 7 million over a decade. The level of payroll employment, which we'll see in a minute, over that decade was flat, no net employment growth. There was a view that these people would get higher paying service jobs and that did not happen. And that's because of the multiplier associated with goods producing jobs. And where you see that and where I can 
clearly make that point, I'm not just guessing, is by showing you the correlation between goods producing jobs and the employment diffusion index. Um, when goods producing jobs go down, again, other jobs in other sectors, including the service sector, go down. Um, and indeed, the employment diffusion index collapsed uh, as you shifted capital spending to China and goods producing jobs collapsed. Um, and, and the good news is that's old news. Uh, fast forward to where we are today, and we'll touch on this in a minute when we look at capital spending. China in 2010 said, I've got enough stuff over here. I have enough factories. We actually now need to shift to the consumer. Um, in 2010, capital spending in China as a share of GDP started to come down, and, is, and in the United States, it started to go up. So did goods producing jobs. And in turn, the employment diffusion index went up. The broader the footprint of industries hiring, the easier it is for people to get a job because you don't need unique skills. Multiple industries are hiring, multiple people can get a job. And so indeed, there is a correlation between the employment diffusion index and the labor force participation rate. As you gouged out goods producing jobs, it, at the end, it meant that less than 50% of our industries, 47% of our industries were hiring, which means it was difficult to get a job if you didn't have a unique specific skill for those sectors that were hiring, and the labor force participation rate went down. What happened? The number of people on disability went up. So today, the good news is, again, that's old news. And we've been focused on this topic for about a decade, something that we've not just uh, 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 recently uh, talked a lot about. We've talked about this for a long time. Um, and so that shift up in the Employment Diffusion Index, strength in job, goods producing jobs, led the upturn in the labor force participation rate in the back half of the last expansion for about four years, 15 through 2019, and then COVID hit. But the employment diffusion index uh, over the past year, as I said, has averaged 65%. In October, it was 70%. It's, the, it's one of the least uh, important leading economic indicators of secular trends that gets absolutely no, no attention. And so the community right now is noting at 81.7, the labor force, prime age labor force participation rate is still below the pre-COVID level. And it's made that they, the consensus is it's going to stay there. We strongly disagree. Over the next 18 months, we would expect it to go back to 83, um, supported by both men and women rejoining the labor market. That's about 2 million labor supply. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of potential labor supply uh, that uh, is going to help mitigate some wage, uh, wage inflation. Cognizant of time here, Jake, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to uh, our view on, the, oh, this is the chart I mentioned, where payroll growth from 2000 through 2010, you had a little bit of a blip, but uh, you actually were flat as a pancake, no job growth, service sector jobs rose, but not enough over a decade to uh, engineer uh, a, a increase. I'm, I'd, I'd be surprised if anybody has ever shown you this, that over a decade, we had no job, uh, we had no job, job growth. And that gets us specifically to capital spending. And, and as I said, you had this important flexion point in 2010 with the beginning of a capital spending cycle uh, when China said, I'm done, uh, uh, I don't need any more factories, uh, et, et cetera. So capital spending for us is, is, is really under underappreciated. On the consumer, let me, let me uh, stop Jake and let's just spend a quick minute on the consumer going over this chart and a couple of the uh, good services uh, uh, charts. But our bottom line is, um, you know, it was going to be fine, but just a lot of uh, volatility within the space. Yeah, so if we, if we model it, um, you know, based on things that tend to track consumption over time, real compensation, real net worth, um, adjusting for obviously the COVID distortions, we're looking at something like 3% real consumer spending uh, next year. Uh, and there's certainly some upside risk to that, but within the consumer space, and if we go to the, the next slide here, we think there's gonna be a lot of bifurcation. Why? Because of the unwind of the effects that we saw during the pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of uh, goods demand that was pulled forward. People were stay at home, uh, work from home. So they had to buy computers, furniture, bought a lot of gym equipment, all of these things that were related to, to basically staying at home. And then you had a lot of pantry stocking, you had, cleaning materials, uh, groceries, et cetera. So you saw both durables and non-durable goods spike to well above uh, their pre-COVID trends. And this is all in real terms. So this is volumes of spending, right? We still remain um, significantly above trend uh, in, in both of those. And again, a lot of this is because we, we're just coming off of the Delta wave. So the third quarter, uh, we saw these, these sort of uh, patterns renew themselves. And on the other hand, 
services remains well below trend. So we're still about 5% below, again, real terms uh, versus the, the, the pre-COVID trend here. As we transition away uh, from, from COVID becoming a pandemic to endemic, hopefully sooner rather than later, again, who knows with this, with this Omicron uh, uh, variant, but as we transition, we don't think that what we've seen over the last 20 months represents a new paradigm for consumer spending. We think that behaviorally, when the consumer is able to, they will revert back uh, to pre-COVID patterns in terms of how much wallet goes to goods, how much wallet goes to services. As we move toward that, what we foresee is some weakness in durables and non-durables. So in 2022, if we moved back to trend and just stayed at trend, you'd actually get a, a, a slight decline in durables and non-durable spending in real terms. You'd also get a pretty large increase uh, in services spending. And so overall spending on this type of pattern gets you to 4% real consumption. Again, a lot of noise internally and a lot of sort of maybe bad headlines for the goods related sectors, for the retail sector in particular, um, but overall an economy that's still supported by robust consumer spending, it's just this transition within uh, the sector uh, that's gonna be most notable and sort of an unwind of what we've had uh, for the better part of the last 20 months or so. So let's now jump to capital spending. Um, uh, because that is going to be another important part, not just of GDP, but of this labor supply, as we've highlighted, um, and then of productivity, and therefore uh, also uh, inflation. So capital spending in, 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 in our space, we would argue is not focused on enough, because again, it's not uh, it, it's only about 13% of GDP, and therefore the community downplays it relative to consumer spending. But without a sustained investment cycle, you don't end up with a strong employment diffusion index. You don't end up with rising labor force participation, et cetera. You don't end up with a healthy consumer. So actually we would argue capital spending is more important to a sustained expansion than consumer, uh, than consumer spending. Um, specifically, just to show you what the growth rate is, um, it, on average, the last cycle, it was about 5%. We've had a very strong V rebound. Uh, we think it moderates something to around, to around eight. Our model suggests seven, but we're actually using eight uh, because, because of some secular changes uh, that are uh, indeed, uh, indeed unfolding. Again, I have to reiterate, it is not just capital spending uh, as a set, subset of GDP. It's what it does to the job market, labor force participation, real median family income, and as you'll see in a minute, um, uh, product, uh, productivity. We monitor it very closely. There are our, 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 uh, timely data. Um, on it. You know, regionally, we can follow it. Uh, obviously, official government data. And again, everything here in the fourth quarter suggests that you, you're, you have strength. Now, one area of weakness is because of COVID, we did pull forward a lot of, and I think this is an important point, Jake, for this consumer idea. Uh, you pulled forward a lot of capital spending on tech equipment. Um, that now has actually slowed some, and there's been a handoff to software and non uh, uh, industrial uh, equipment. So you're actually broadening out uh, uh, capital uh, capital spending right now. Here's a slightly longer term. You can see where technology in general has been a major driver of U.S. capex. Um, uh, in, in, indeed, uh, information technology equipment as a share of capex has actually been coming down. Software has been going up. This is a level chart of capex. It was up over 60% the last cycle. Again, I would argue none of you have spent see enough uh, charts on U.S. capital on, on U.S. capital uh, spending. Um, as, as I mentioned, tech equipment is now slowing, but software is now accelerating. And what's so fascinating about software, it's being utilized across from from smaller businesses, including restaurants, to larger businesses, to factories, and it's actually a cheaper way uh, to spend on capex. Um, and it's, it, it makes more for quicker productivity improvements than you otherwise uh, otherwise uh, would have. As I mentioned, we're also very bullish on industrial equipment capital spending. We're there also, you've had very, very strong, uh, very, very strong, uh, strong growth. But within capital spending, there is again, a lot of noise. Um, there, there are clear domestic positive trends, but there are clear international headwinds. And that gives me uh, China. Um, if China is shifting down growth, which they have, yeah, it's going to be key for the focus on U.S. capital good companies, less multinational capital good companies, and indeed, you've seen it. You've seen it in uh, you've seen it in stocks, um, and uh, we also see it uh, in 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 data. We track capital spending very very closely. Uh, we actually screen uh, a list of companies for their capital spending plans, 
And over the past year, uh, 575 companies have announced some, some form of capital spending. This correlates uh, lead slightly government data. And so at the end of the day, again, a very robust CapEx outlook for, 20, uh, for 2022. We also monitor companies um, that announce uh, onshoring into the United States where they are shifting production from China or Germany back to the United States. This is a unique list. This is different. It's also been an arising trend for, for a decade. It is cyclical. Um, did get hit with COVID, but um, uh, has uh, got hit actually with the Delta variant. Uh, but we, we think into 2022, this, this measure also goes up. But the stock market is actually telling you the wrong signal. If you look at capital goods relative to the S&P 1500, they've been big underperformers, but they're big underperformers because of China. Uh, the domestic oriented companies have actually outperformed significantly, which is what these charts all, all highlight. So actually S&P categories, uh, again, similar to looking at inventory sales ratios, they tell you the wrong message about what's going on in US, uh, US economic uh, activity. I guess I have to say this, Jay, um, I apologize, this chart is a little fuzzy, but with this theme, uh, which is the uh, capital spending driving US economic activity, uh, goods producing jobs are generally in the middle part of the country. And so middle America is our favorite uh, emerging uh, emerging market. Unemployment rates uh, in the middle part of the country, about 4.7 percent, uh, roughly two percentage points lower than they are in the coast. And so this is what we're particularly uh, optimistic, uh, optimistic on. As I mentioned, it's capital spending that gives you incremental labor supply, and it's also capital spending that gets you productivity. You can't get productivity without investing and reinvesting in your business. And so productivity did start to improve the last cycle. Um, this is a three-year average. During COVID crisis, it popped a lot. It's just kind of a recession effect. Uh, it did slow sharply in the third quarter, actually declined slightly in the third quarter on a year-over-year -year basis. We, again, we, we tend to smooth things out looking for clear trends. It's uh, going to end the year at about 2%, and we think next year it's going to be 2.5%, and we don't think that's aggressive. Um, productivity is key. Labor supply is key because, because that those two things then give you uh, unit labor costs, um, a key part of, of, of inflation. Um, and they also then drive potential GDP growth. And with the employment diffusion index rising, potential GDP growth started to rise, improve the last cycle up at least to 2%. Um, uh, a shorter term measure suggest it could have been as high as, 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 as uh, three. Um, again, the employment diffusion index is a very powerful secular leading indicator. Uh, it helps explain why our market has generally outperformed other markets. Uh, again, because we have such a healthy capital spending job cycle, giving a stronger potential uh, GD, uh, GDP growth. I'm going to jump to uh, inflation uh, now, but I want you to keep in mind uh, what we've just, just talked about. Um, and so this is, well, I guess I should go to this uh, page first, uh, Jake. Uh, this kind of pulls together our, our outlook uh, where we do see a significant slowdown in, in, in inflation. I, mean, I, I would show the next one uh, uh, too first, uh, Nancy, just the, showing the dispersion, right? This, this kind of tells the story of what, we, of what we just went through over the last 20 months. And you know, everyone talks about, a lot of people have talked about uh, stagflation, uh, the th that word's been thrown around a lot. We couldn't disagree more with that, right? So one, we don't have the stack bar on the unemployment rate continues to make new lows every month. Uh, the labor market's the healthiest I think we've seen in decades. Uh, and the other part of it is on the inflation front, you have a lot of bifurcation within the inflation components, unlike the 1970s. In the 1970s, you had synchronized inflation. Everything was going up, everything was going up a lot, right? This time around, you have the what tend to be the volatile components of inflation which are a lot of the goods um, areas where we've seen this big supply demand dislocation. Uh, again, households are washed with cash, production down, uh, uh, log jams at the ports, et cetera. And so the, the, these, these, price, these items that tend to change price frequently, they were running in double digits on a year over year basis. You see this in the flexible core CPI in this chart, almost 15% year over year um, in, in October. And then the sticky basket, which looks at things that don't move that frequently in price, and that includes things like shelter, uh, medical care, um, services, et cetera, you know, that's still hovering around 3%, right? Clearly did not break out. Uh, and even with our view that you are gonna get some services inflation, you're still not gonna get a significant breakout here. And so this is a key distinction. And as we shift from this goods to, ser uh, goods to services uh, compositionally, uh, the, the, the consumer spending piece uh, that we went over earlier, and as the goods sector potentially 
is dealing with too much inventory building in, in, in 2022, uh, again, something we covered earlier, earlier um, then this shifts the other way. You get outright goods deflation, you get this flexible piece of inflation now deflating, which again, look at the chart, it goes through pockets of deflation uh, pretty regularly, specifically in the last couple of decades, right? So now if we turn to the, to the previous page, you can see how when we build out um, our inflation profile for next year, looking for goods deflation in the back half of the year, uh, again, too many inventories being built at the good space, this goods to services handoff, so demand weakening in the good space, outright deflation in the second half of, of 2022. Some services-based inflation, you're seeing rents go up for sure. You're seeing this lagged effect of higher home prices feed through to shelter. We have shelter moving up. We have it with a four handle in, in, in pretty much the bulk of 2022, maybe peaking at about four and a half in the middle of the year. Not going to be enough from an inflation standpoint to offset what's likely to be significant goods deflation. And then add on to that very tough comps from 2021, right? We're dealing right now with head-on inflation that's above 6%. Uh, that was the last print in October. So when you compare 22 to 21, mathematically, it gets easier to get a disinflation trend uh, 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 just in the numbers. And so all of these factors taken together, you could see headline inflation in the US by, by the fourth quarter of next year, move back down to 1% or even slightly lower. And you could see core uh, move back down 2% or even slightly below that. Uh, again, we're not being significantly aggressive with our deflation in goods. We think it could be more than that if, if the inventory story sort of gets out of, out of control in terms of the overbuilding. Um, and so you know, it's some, something to be mindful of. But yeah, we think that with these pieces uh, in place, you could see material disinflation uh, in the back half of uh, 2022. The other part of the inflation story is what's going on with, uh, with wages. Um, and there, again, I was trying to weave through uh, the story. We think we do have ample labor supply. We think we do have um, stronger productivity growth. Now, near term, you've had quite a shift up. So pardon me while I flip to the right page. Uh, you have had a clear shift up in wage inflation, average hourly earnings close to five, employment cost index uh, right now around four, probably going to four and a half to five in the in the in the fourth uh, in the fourth quarter. But we would argue that uh, that is also a temporary blip uh, associated with supply being held back because of the COVID situation in the summer, and then also the extended unemployment uh, benefits. And we would expect wage inflation to move back down toward about three and a half percent. I'm going through this too quickly because I'm cognizant of the time. Um, but our bottom line is, and we can come back to this, is that we actually think what's going on is a bigger story. Um, and that is that we have seen the end of secular stagnation uh, in the United States. We would define secular stagnation maybe very differently than uh, is commonly talked about. Um, we don't think it's because of the collapse of the housing bubble and, 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 and as a result, the consumer's unwillingness to continue to borrow. I don't think that's such a bad thing. Um, uh, we would argue it was directly related to the collapse in the number of industries hiring, which reduced the demand for labor that shifted uh, the employment cost index down to 2% for most of the last decade. By the back half, we were starting to get some wage inflation with that shift up in demand. Um, uh, but we think we're not going back to two. We think secular stagnation, I think through all of the noise that's happening right now, there's actually something very positive happening. Um, and wage inflation is now, we would argue trough at three again at some point. Right now it's above three. This, this index probably goes above four in the fourth quarter, but then we think we settle in at something around three and a half percent. Um, and if I have three and a half percent uh, wage inflation, but I have two and a half percent productivity, that gives you unit labor costs of of, of one percent. And pardon me, uh, unit labor costs are probably the single best leading indicator of inflation. And so again, three and a half wage inflation, two and a half productivity gets you one unit labor cost. Say we're, we're wrong. What if you're 4% wages and 2% uh, uh, productivity, which is where we were pre-COVID? That gets you 2% unit labor costs. That still is an important headwind uh, to uh, a sustained period of low in, in inflation. Now, let me let me end on on our, our global our global outlook. I'm just going to uh, just going to go over it quickly and then stop. Um, we do think we will have a more clear global slowdown. The global economy, I give you the Eurozone, is much more uh, susceptible to higher energy prices than the United States is. 
Within the EM world, you have EM central banks tightening, which you can see here in part of this list. They've been tightening now for over a year. It takes roughly a year for changes in rates to have a negative impact on the economy. So if you recall, we said we had the global US PMI going down to 50, uh, 54. Um, we have the global PMI actually going down to 50, with the Eurozone PMI actually moving below 50. EM PMI is also moving a little bit below 50. So the bigger conclusion is the U.S. continues to be the driver of global growth, but globally you do see a slowdown. Um, and that's important also to our inflation forecast, because every time you get a, a global slowdown, you get a peak in commodity prices, another very out of consensus call um, as Global PMI comes down, commodity prices at least stabilize, if not hooked down some. And also same with um, uh, with, with the PMI and we're really out of consensus call. By the back half of 2022, we think the rise in rates is over um, with this with this global with this global slowdown, both short uh, and long term uh, long term rates. So let me let me stop there. Um, I went a little bit over, um, uh, but uh, let me stop there, uh, Mark, and and we can open it up to uh, questions. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Jake. Um, and as we said at the outset, folks, we're going to uh, um, try this without a net. If you've got a question for our, our good folks here, go ahead and unmute your microphone and, and uh, fire away. Uh, they're all being shy today, Nancy. Sorry. Nancy, um, can you just comment again, what was the secular dynamic that was causing the decline in the labor participation? I, I, you went through it. I just missed it. So I apologize. I went through things. My, um, with this COVID stuff, obviously, people hear you at home talking. And my, uh, my, my husband said, you talk too fast. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, this is, well... Let me find the right page. It has to do with in 2000, China joining WTO. What happened with that? US companies started to shift production. Here we go. US companies started to shift production um, away from the United States to China. And so China's investment to GDP rose sharply. Um, US capital spending deteriorated. Um, capital spending uh, has a, has a important, uh, is an important driver of jobs. Um, in that it creates goods producing jobs. And then as that, let me, I can, uh, let me go back, check my, check my notes here. Hold on a second. Um, uh, as that capital spending uh, left the United States, this is 2000 again, right? Capital spending deteriorated. You goods producing jobs dropped by 7 million. 7 million drop over a decade in goods producing jobs. Again, in economics, goods producing jobs have a high job multiplier. For every job created, there are three to five jobs created in other industries, including services. And so that's the blue, uh, uh, goods producing jobs are underappreciated um, because of that multiplier. And you can, you can, you can see uh, that multiplier effect on the negative side, goods producing jobs go down. Again, that means jobs go down in other sectors, right? And, and that took the employment diffusion index down, which is the percentage of industries hiring. This is part of the payroll employment report. Every month, this number is there. Just nobody looks at it except us. Um, and once you narrow the percentage of industries hiring, if you don't have that specific skill for the industries that are hiring, you don't get a job. And so what happens? People dropped out of the labor force. This isn't a forecast. It happened. The good news is in 2010, China said, I'm done. I've got enough capital spending. I've got enough investment in our country. They, 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 they literally said this. And then capital spending as a share of GDP started to come down in China in 2010. Capital spending as a share of GDP started to come up in the United States. Goods producing jobs started to grow in 2010. The employment diffusion index started to increase, reflecting the positive multiplier from goods producing jobs. When that happens, it's easier for people with, with different skills to get a job. 
and the employment diffusion index goes up. Let me let me um, take you back to another uh, a secular page, kind of making the same point. Uh, but over here, what what as the employment as the labor force participation rate went down, where did these people go? They went on disability. It, it's it's really impressive the way I was going to use the word cool, but it's really impressive the way this is all linked together. Capital spending, goods producing jobs, the multiplier effect, the employment diffusion index, um, uh, and the number of people on disability. What's the number here, Jake? If this number goes down, what do you, you if disability continues to go down, what's two million more? Something if like it goes that. Out to, yeah, if it goes down to like two and a half. It's two yeah. million more people for the labor force. I mean, there's plenty, and if this number goes back up to 83, that's another 2 million. That's 4 million people right there that could rejoin uh, the, the, the labor force. That's an incredibly healthy labor market. So whenever I go over this, I always feel like I'm preaching and giving a sermon. I apologize, <laughs> but it's just underappreciated. The important, I grew up, I grew up in a factory town. I, uh, I saw the multiplier. One of the reasons I'm an economist is because I wanted to, uh, what in the heck happened to my town? I kind of understand it now. The job multiplier was a giant sucking sound, destroyed the entire city state. Big chunk of the Midwest. The good news is that's done. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about why the labor force participation rate rose in the back half of the last expansion. Nobody talks about why it went down for a decade. Everybody's just looking at it, oh, it's low and therefore it's a problem and blah, blah, blah. No, it's recovered already. And the backdrop is very supportive of it continuing to recover. So I have a question for you, Nancy. Sure. Uh, so that diffusion index in the Midwest, your new emerging markets, uh, what does that look like I'm not sure you can you can do that, uh, but I'll, I don't know if we have it regionally like that. We should check, Jake, good question. But what I do know is that the unemployment rates for the middle part of the country, Midwest and South, are 4.7%, and on the coasts, they're 6.7%. So there is something magical about uh, the, the, the health of the labor markets in the Midwest, two percentage points lower than the coasts. Thank you. Nancy, can you also comment on um, maybe going beyond your, your CapEx forecast? So 8% next year, and then does it kind of trend down to 5% or, or how sustainable are you expecting CapEx spend to be uh, beyond that uh, 2022 timeframe? Um. I'm, I'm not. So, I'm not looking for a number. I'm just how yeah. how sustainable is the elevated capex? How are you thinking about that? So I don't have all the charts here, even though it's a 260 page handout. But there's something <laughs> called capital stock growth, and capital stock growth in the United States is still pretty anemic. It's maybe about two percent. Um, again, and, and, and I, Jake, I don't know if you remember. You know, a four number is would be something uh, more normal. So we have to rebuild a lot of our capital stock, which is what we're doing right now. But you can't keep growing 8%. Yes, it's going to 2023. Um, you're you're going to start to see a slowdown. Again, I, I it, it, five sounds like a reasonable number. Uh, but this is a secular shift up in capital spending. Capital spending cycles are classically 30 years. It doesn't mean you don't have dips within those 30 years. You will. And when we get a... Fed tightening cycle and uh, profits start to decline, capital spending will decline. It is not, it is definitely cyclical. Uh, but the secular backdrop for the next couple of years, um, and, and if anything, COVID has, has again pulled this, made the story even, even more powerful because of the disruption to the supply chain. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll slow and eventually it will decline again uh, once, uh, once. Fed raises rates and corporate profits go down at, at the end of at the end of the cycle. But for, for the next two to three years, we think it, it it probably grows faster than GDP. 
Yeah, just to add to that, Nancy, I think if you look at how the Fed um, has taken rates so down artificially versus where potential growth is, I think that's on 102 in your in your deck here. Yeah. Uh, so this spread between what potential GDP has done over the last decade, which has been up, uh, and where this and where the Fed has anchored this this idea of neutral, uh, sort of longer run uh, Fed funds uh, adjusted for inflation. That big deviation is very positive for, for capital spending. Um, this sort of the ability to discount growth at artificially low rates set by the set by the central bank. Uh, and historically, you see this this spread between potential GDP and and neutral Fed funds uh, tends to correlate well with um, intensity of capex investing uh, in the United States. And this is something that was Fed, Fed, the Fed tied. Uh, the appropriate Fed funds rate, the long run Fed funds rate to, to potential GDP historically, there was an 80% correlation right up until the financial crisis. Um, and then it's been completely delinked. And so you're able to fund projects at rates that are uh, de facto artificially low, set by, set by the central bank. And again, it's a, it's a positive backdrop uh, within the context of we're still um, by and large delevering as a country, right? So we're, the, the risk that, that you have a credit event because of this low financing cost seems low. Uh, it's positive for, for capital investment. Last time you had something like that was in the 90s, the last time you had a very strong capital spending cycle. And our colleague Roberto would say, we're not gonna take the punch pull away anytime soon. I.e. the Fed doesn't believe anything I just told you. <laughs> Except for maybe inflation is going to stay low. <laughs> the stronger potential GDP growth they don't buy. Hello, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a couple questions. Well, one at least. So if we're talking about jobs that are, you know, we have 10 million some odd jobs open and only you know, I don't know what it is, four or five million people looking for a job or whatever. So you have people out there who they see a they see a job opening and it says what fifteen dollars an hour or whatever. Okay. They may not want that job, they may not want that job, they may not need that job, they may not be able to get that job for reasons such as either corona uh vax mandates or or skills mismatch. So do you have any estimate as to why uh, lower paying jobs are being so hard to fill in the sense that uh, you know, I have a friend who owns a pizzeria. She cannot get employees. She also cannot get employees to either show up or come on time or do quality work. So what would you say is the percentage of the factors of jobs not being filled between lack of skills, lack of need because they have savings, um, lack of ability because they aren't going to get the vaccine, or just simply they don't want a job right now. I'll let me pass it over to Jake. The bottom line is a lot of the factors holding people back from getting a job are slowly but surely ending. I'm trying to find the right page here, Jake. Um, what, the 180, thank you. 181, yep. Up, up. there you go. Yeah, so we think, we think one of the big factors was uh, very generous government programs that where, where the spread between what folks were making specifically in the low wage sectors and what they were able to make on unemployment uh, was significant. There was a significant pickup. So look at leisure and hospitality, for example, on this chart here. Uh, just on UI benefits alone, Folks were making up to 30% more than in their previous wages. Now you tack onto that uh, rent eviction moratoriums, you tack onto that multiple stimulus checks, and there was a lot more disposable income for this cohort uh, than, than in their previous job, right? So there was a huge incentive. This incentive only started to roll off in earnest uh, in September. Uh, and since then, you know, we've, we've had one payroll report. And we saw 600,000 plus on, on the private side, leisure hospitality added almost 200,000. So these trends are starting to reverse. Um, this, this here shows this relationship between people on uh, collecting continuing claims at the state level and payroll growth. It was almost one for one through the beginning of September. And what happened since then? With the expiry, we saw almost an additional 4 million people drop out of the rolls. This is labor supply that was basically locked up by enhanced unemployment insurance. 
and by and large concentrated in the lower wage sectors. You're not gonna get 4 million jobs in one fell swoop. We got 600 in October. We think we're gonna get north of 700 on Friday. Uh, the ADP report was, was quite healthy this morning. Um, so slowly but surely, you're gonna, you're gonna call all these positions back. And this, this shortage, this artificial shortage, specifically in the lower wage cohorts, if you go to 182, uh, Nancy, has led to this big bifurcation in wage growth. You've had wage growth in the, in the lower skilled sectors, leisure hospitality, again, the poster child for this thing. Wages rose to almost 13% year over year over the summer. Why? Because job openings went up a million from February through July, right? Demand went way up for work. Supply was locked up by enhanced benefits and wages soared. In contrast, uh, higher paying industries like financial services, like tech, those have rolled over. Wage growth there has rolled over, right? The, the, the pockets of wage increases are the pockets where you had these, these artificial labor supply lockups because we think by and large uh, government programs were, that were extremely generous. For the first time ever, look at this middle top chart. You have wage growth for high school or less outpacing bachelor's degree wage growth, right? Look at the spread just below that. It's below one, it 0.85 in October. Uh, this is a, a phenomenon that we've, that we've never seen before. And I think uh, when you look at, when you drill into the sectors, uh, this dispersion in wage growth, which is on the bottom left there, which is at a record high, is being driven by these pockets of supply uh, where, where supply was artificially withheld from the market because of generous benefits. We think that as now you move beyond um, uh, the, these government programs, wage uh, uh, employment growth will accelerate in these sectors. People will re-engage in the labor market and you'll start to see some ebbing um, in wage pressures uh, in, the, in these areas. So if we have more VAX mandates, which could lead to more unemployment, which could lead to more unemployment benefits, we're going to go back to the same problem again. So I would say that that would be a bad policy. Would you agree or disagree? I would agree. Yeah, I mean, we don't. Yeah. And, and they're being challenged in the courts. You know, who, who knows where they're going to end up? Um, I would also say that where we've seen it so far, it's it's impacted a very small percentage of the labor force. I mean, the the, the, the trend has been to get vaccinated. Um, again, we haven't seen it in, in sort of the goods producing areas yet because the, the mandates haven't been broadened out. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a risk that's out there. Uh, but again, it's being challenged. It's, it's been thrown out in a couple of places already. Uh, so, so we'll see where that goes. Again, it, it, but it would be another example of, of government policy, bad government policy, uh, constraining labor supply in a market where labor supply is already historically tight. And also for your friend in the pizzeria, again, secular stagnation, wage inflation is over. You know, some businesses, business communities maybe enjoyed wage inflation of only 2%, um, but you destroyed real median family income growth. Uh, obviously created a lot of the inequality. And so, unfortunately, yes, the level of wages has probably shifted up at, and as we end stagnation. Um, but we do think the growth rate will moderate next year as this labor supply re uh, re-enters the workforce. There was another article in the paper today um, talking about how, and we need to look at this uh, on Friday, um, labor force participation rate for teenagers is up. And so I'm, that really uh, actually excited me. Um, I love instilling the work ethic uh, in, in younger kids. I always started to work when I was 13, um, worked my father's store. Um, but I, I love the fact that potentially teenage labor force participation rate is going, is going up. That's a very, very healthy sign. The article goes on, talks about how kids, you know, they're not going to learn as much at school by, by uh, you know, having a job. And that to me was a Thanks, Pum. It was like, give me a break. World War experience is always great for younger kids. Thank you. Right. We, are, we are rapidly coming to the end of the hour uh, or the half hour. Um, let's try and get one more question in before we let these good people go. Anybody? If nobody else has a question, I have one more. Ed, go for it. Is there an estimate uh, about what the effect would be on growth and job growth, GDP growth and job growth, if the better back, build back better plan is passed versus if it is not? Go ahead, Jake. One of the things we worry about in there is this child tax credit. Um, 
and the removal of the work requirement. And again, we don't we don't know whether this gets through. I know that uh, Mansion is is opposed to it, uh, so that's obviously a big stumbling block. Uh, but if you remove the work requirement from this child tax credit, it creates a massive incentive for the lowest quintile of, of income earners to leave the labor force. It's been estimated by University of Chicago and, and a couple of others that you could see upwards of a million and a half people leave the labor force because of that provision alone. That to us is the, 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 the sort of the scariest thing in that entire bill because it's a secular shift. It's, it's, it's again, a, a further deterioration of the work ethic. It's more people out of the labor force, uh, more people on, on uh, sort of government subsidies. Uh, trends that we experimented with during the pandemic and it didn't turn out well, uh, this is something that would be sort of locked in for the longer term. So yeah, we're, we're especially worried about that and, and hopefully um, they, they push back hard against that, uh, folks like Manchin, et cetera. But anyway, uh... Uh, Mark, Andrew, thank you very much. Happy holidays to everybody. Stay healthy, obviously. Uh, thanks for doing this uh, virtually. I think that is still the way to go, unfortunately, but we do look forward to doing more things in person at some point in 2022. And as do we, and thank you, Nancy. Thank, thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, Jake, Jay, thanks for uh, getting this set up. And again, special thanks to um, Andrew Rem for making sure we got this one in uh, in December. It looks like, looks like it was uh, the right thing to do. So um, happy holidays right back at you and uh, look forward to seeing you all in person in 2022. Take care. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nancy. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.